There you go. So you probably see a notice that that we're going. Yep, we're live. Okay. Yep. So the let me go ahead and get the countdown clock here. Let me share my screen. So you probably see a notice that, that we're going. Yep, we're live. Okay. Let me go back yep. here. So the let me go ahead and get the countdown clock here. Let me share my screen. Oh right, wait, I'll stop it because I'll wait for about another. Just about another minute and then we'll start the clock. Oh, okay. So everything we say, everybody will hear, but we'll officially begin in 10 minutes. So right, I'll stop it because I'll wait for about another. And then I'm getting that echo. And then we'll start yeah, you need to turn off the, you've got an extra window open. Yep. So everything we, there we go. Okay, here we go. Great. So what, yeah, once we start the countdown clock, we uh, send YouTube automatically sends notices out to about fifteen thousand people who will uh, start to log in. So we can continue our our discussion. I think it's fascinating that uh, on the one hand you've got this revival of. Uh, um, the idea of the ghost in American literature. And I think, Angela, you would probably agree that there's been uh, a, a new infusion of nonfiction scholarly literature on the esoteric at the same time in the last 20 years. Um, yeah, I'm not probably an expert on ghost literature, to be honest, <laughs> but um, yeah, it is definitely uh, a theme that emerges in historic circles as well. So can I can I ask you, Angela, when you're when you were studying religious studies, how did you find it correlating with witchcraft and witchcraft practices? Uh, do you mean the relation between religious studies and witchcraft or yeah, the relationship? Yeah. <laughs> well, witchcraft is uh, a, a spiritual and um, a religious practice. It is a practice that is for some people seen as religious, for some people as spiritual, for some people as a technology that they use to achieve things. So it is part of, you know, if you want to study witchcraft and how people do it and what's happening there and the meaning making, the belief making that people engaging with these practices are uh, doing, then it is part of the religious studies um, umbrella in terms of the academic field, um, insofar as you're studying it as a, as a practice, basically. You can study it from a, from a historical point of view, from an anthropological point of view. My research was anthropological, so I was doing field work with people. Mm. Um, so I was undertaking um, celebrations, rituals, initiations to um, fully participate. In anthropology, there's a methodology called participant observation, where you are there on the field with uh, with practitioners and you are, the, you are a scholar. So that's why you are a participant observer, because in one way you are an observer, an outsider, and on the other, in another way, you are an insider because you are there with people and you're investigating what's, what's happening. Interesting. Yeah, I really like anthropological research. I think it's a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah. Whereas I guess your work was more on, uh, on on the literature, so it's more on the books. Yeah, but there is a large amount of, you know, um, the thing about ghost literature and all art, really, it, is it emerges from the culture from which it is, you know, it reflects the culture from which it emerges and which is why it sort of diff changes every time, every in every literary period or every artistic period, any cultural period of history, the art and the literature that's coming out of that period is always different, as you know. And so um, I, I think to really study literature, you really have to study the culture from which it is emerging. So I, I also included a large sort of interdisciplinary element when I was um, doing the research, because the only real way to understand what art is reflecting is to really look at the culture as well. So that, so, and they play off each other, you know, cause you look at 
you look at what's being generated artistically and creatively and and then you sort of look at what is this reflecting and then in turn it is like well why is it different why is it what's making it different now to say 50 years ago so it's really kind of interesting you, you can't really separate them do you know what I mean it's almost like you take you look at one thing then you have to kind of go back and look at the culture to understand something so I think uh, it's been really interesting as an interdisciplinary study as well. So I've been looking at a lot of um, just sort of cultural movements, um, the spiritual, the not not religious movement has been a big factor. Um, sort of even the counterculture movement from the sixties, which you know was very influential on today's art and literature. So it's been um, yeah, it's been really interesting just sort of looking at when you start to take fifty years of cultural developments, you know, together. Uh, including scientific developments in the near, near death experience literature, which has really boomed because of advances in technology and resuscitation. Um, it's you can see how it starts to seep into the sort of the general consciousness. It's not like there's some big announcement. It's just like over the years, it just seeps, 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 and then new forms of art and literature and expression start arising from it. So I find it very interesting. And, and to boot, you're a practicing medium. Yeah. Yeah, which also sort of brings a different perspective to it as well. So, you know, I'm reading stuff. I'm reading literature. I'm also reading theory and I'm reading interdisciplinary elements from, I suppose, a different vantage point from what most academics would read it from. You know, most academics would probably just read it as an exploration of what somebody's saying. And I'm looking at it going as an exploration of how real, how are we capturing reality here at all, you know, so, or can we? So I think the angles, people sort of wonder, like, where is that coming from? Well, you know, I, I didn't, it wasn't a big leap for me to move from thinking of consciousness as just this or thinking of the consciousness as just, or, or the ghost as this very limited thing it's always been into something that is, you know, the ghost has always been the past haunting the future, you know. And for me, I see the ghost as the future because that's where we're all heading, you know. Do your academic advisors and colleagues uh, know that you are a practicing medium? Well, I haven't discussed it with them, um, but I mean, all you have to do is Google me. I mean, it's on Wikipedia, so um, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't take much to find out. You're not hiding it. I mean, no, book. no, no, yeah, no. And I and my book, yeah, I have a best-selling book <laughs> that talks about the whole thing. So, uh, you know, so yeah, no. I think you'd have to really have your head in the sand not to know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I remember, Angela, when we first spoke, you indicated to me that you didn't want it to be, uh, you were concerned about how your academic colleagues would view your personal involvement. Uh, I don't talk publicly about whether I'm involved or not. Uh, I think it's a bit different when you're in religious studies uh, compared to when you are in literature or in history. Uh, but um, yeah, I just decided to just keep it private for now. And I don't know whether in the future I will change my mind. It was definitely advised to me by more experienced scholar scholars in my field. Yeah. Well, I've done field work too. I was uh, a criminology student and did uh, sociological field work uh, using the uh, participant observer method. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the one that I did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, it presents its own issues, of course, and but I I still find it quite exciting as research method. I find anthropology of religion very, very fun. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I know you're familiar with Jack Hunter. Yeah, yeah, He's I know. Jack pushing Hunter. the boundaries of anthropology. In that word. Yes, he, yeah, he, um, I think that he was one who coined paraanthropology. Yeah, uh, he yeah he he created a journal on paranthropology. Yeah. So we have a, an interview scheduled with him soon. He has uh, a, a new book out on I think um, is it called High Weirdness. He's he's looking at you know the weirdest strangest things he can come up with. 
that mm-hmm. anthropologists have found in is saying we we really have to pay attention to to these things. They're not just anomalies; they're central to uh, understanding what's going on. The great title: High Weirdness. I'm not sure if that's the exact title, but that's that's sort of the idea. Was it deep? Was was it deep weird? I have a vague memory of. It, that's probably it. Deep weird. Deep weird. I've got, I've got the book on my computer, but um, uh, yeah, it's getting a lot of attention as far as I can tell. And I know uh, he comes right out and says, uh, for example, spirits are real. They're not just a figment of our imagination. Hmm. So we're about to start. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jeffrey Mishlov. I'm with my co-host, Emmy Vadness. It's our Halloween special program uh, today. I have my magic wand. Emmy has her crystal ball handy. I see it here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have two wonderful guests, Angela Puka, who recently received her doctoral degree at uh, I hope I pronounced this correctly. I know the university has... University of Leeds. <laughs> university of Leeds and Karen Francis McCarthy, who is completing her doctoral degree at the University of Birmingham, uh, both in the UK, although neither is originally British. No. I guess it's fair to say. And uh, Angela is Italian and Karen is Irish. Uh But we're here. Uh, Karen is also a practicing medium. She is the author of the book, uh, Till Death, Don't Us Part, describing her transformation from what I would call a hard-boiled war reporter to a spiritist medium. Um, Angela is an expert on uh, Italian witchcraft and uh, is very up to date on the burgeoning literature that's now coming out in esoteric studies. So we have two ideal guests for the season. And uh, thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. And I also have a YouTube channel called Angela Symposium. So (laughs) if you guys are interested in the academic study of historicism, you might want to check it out. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. You, Angela and Karen have both been, of course, previous guests on the New Thinking Aloud channel. So we're, we're delighted to have both of you here. And uh, before we begin to take questions from our viewers, uh, I think it would be nice if you could each make an a, a opening statement, talk a little bit about your background, your current interests, and and maybe say something about, uh, from your point of view, the the meaning and perhaps the history of Halloween. Karen, would you like to? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I, you know, Irish academic slash medium or author. I'm also a teacher um, in, you know, the area of mis- of mediumship and mysticism. But I was, as you mentioned, I used to be a journalist. Uh, My first book was part of the Northern Ireland peace process. And then when my fiancé died very suddenly, um, about 13 years ago, um, uh, in a mediumship ability that I had in childhood that I had long since lost interest in and ignored, uh, just sort of kind of came back with a force. And so one thing led to another. I I wrote about this in Till Death Don't Just Part, a memoir I wrote, um, about trying to make that turn from normal life into these the sort of expanded consciousness and this understanding, or and tr- trying to come to understand the nature of the afterlife. So it's a really, really fascinating journey for me. So I, I, I did write about it, and hopefully other people will find it fascinating too. Um, I did then spend about four years back and forth studying mediumship, training in mediumship at the Arthur Finlay College in just outside London there, and um, have three awards from the college, um, mediumship, healing, and public speaking, which was 
really pretty tough, but I'm glad that's over. And then, um, and now I'm just coming up on the writer part of my doctorate on contemporary ghost literature. So I've been looking at what's happening in ghost literature, how it's reflecting, you know, contemporary culture, but also how co contemporary culture is creating shifts in how we perceive and consider discarnate consciousness. So we're, we were moving beyond the ghost sort of relic of Scrooge at Christmas into something that's a lot more sophisticated in terms of an ex exploration of consciousness. Um, because all of this literature that I'm looking at, my cohort, is all set in the afterlife, narrated by ghosts. So they've all been drawn out of the sort of dark, dusty corners into sort of mainstream. It's been very, very much normalized, I would say. Uh, in a very wide range of literature. So it's quite exciting as well, I find, just to find that this is a cultural shift. It's not just, oh, somebody wrote a novel. The novel exists because there's been a cultural shift. So I've been really enjoying exploring that as well. And, and Angela, I think you would agree there's also been a cultural shift. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I can introduce myself if you want as well. Um, so yeah, as you said, I got my PhD two years ago uh, from the University of Leeds, and um, ever since then I've lectured at universities, various universities. I recently gave a talk at Harvard, um, and I was lecturing at the University of Catania a few weeks ago. Um, and I also have I'm very passionate about my project of delivering academic knowledge in the study of historicism from a religious studies point of view uh, on my social media platforms. So yeah, I think that there has been recently a shift in terms of uh, interest in, in historicism. And what I can talk about is more from a religious studies point of view, because that's the field that I'm in. And uh, the types of topics that I that I've researched, like contemporary paganism and uh, contemporary witchcraft and shamanism. And what I've noticed recently is that there is an increasing number of academics who research these topics in, in academia that research esotericism. So that's that's really interesting. And that's a positive shift, in my opinion. Well, I just want to say welcome to both of you. And for those listening, welcome to all of our viewers and listeners that the topic today is ghosts and magic in celebration of Halloween, but also really understanding spirits and the power of magic from these two beautiful guests and perspectives. Also, I want to just give Karen an opportunity since, uh, Angela, you mentioned your YouTube channel. How can people find more information about you, Karen? Oh, you could just go to my website. It links off to YouTube and whatnot from there. My website is karenfrancismccarthy.com. I think it's in the description. I think you put it in the description. It is. Yeah. Just for those listening. And then also, if we could start off with sharing a little bit of what you two know about the history of Halloween and how it relates to your academic and spiritual interests and background. Shall I go first? Angela? Yeah, sure. So um, I uh, was recently in a place in County Roscommon over towards the west of Ireland called Uv Nagat, which is the Cave of the Cats. And the Cave of the Cats strangely enough, is just a hole in, the fee in a farmer's field um, that you kind of just have to find your way down a dark little narrow road upon. But the Cave of the Cats is was from an ancient, um, there was an ancient sort of town or city around there, Rathgrohan. And um, what has grown up around this is that when you go into this cave, which is actually quite frightening because it's very narrow and it's got quite a severe drop and you have to kind of have to go in on your back, like you're going down a hole, you know, it's got, you have to go in like this to get it. But when you get into the cave, it's just this large sensory deprivation cave. So you can understand how in ancient civilizations you go in, there's no sound, there's no smell, there's dead air, so there's no echo that became this kind of phenomena that became in folklore then associated with a thin place, what's called the thin place in Ireland, which is where the veil between worlds is very thin. And so when you go into it, it's actually quite frightening. I mean, even now going in with your cell phone, thinking I could call my, well, you probably wouldn't be able to call your way out. But, you know, I have photographs, I must post them. I'll post them on Facebook or something if anyone's interested of this hole in the ground. And there's just like this little sign that says, just be careful going down. Do you know, this is, 
you're you're in here courtesy of Farmer Brown, whatever his name is. Yeah, like if it was America, there'd be like T-shirt stands and all sorts of things around it. You know, I mean, this is just takes quite a lot of effort to find this hole in the ground. And so you go down into this hole and there you are. So what has sort of arisen around the Cave of the Cats is that all of the nefarious creatures from Irish folklore emerged from the Cave of the Cats at Halloween. Now, we know Halloween is sort of the harvest. It's the sort of the taking in for the harvest. It's the shift traditionally in ancient cultures between the the sort of productive fertile part of the year into the quiet, you know, dead part of the year where we go into long nights, short days where nothing grows. And so we go into that sleepy part of the year. So in all cultures, there is that demarcation around the end of October when the harvest is taken in and then we wait until the spring, nothing grows. And we know this in all cultures and all. So all sorts of stories have come out of this in all cultures. But in Ireland, what happened was all of the nefarious creatures like the Slough and Amarv, like the Morrigan, all of these, you know, creatures who would come steal your kids, steal your teeth, you know, steal you, bring you back into the cave of the cats, you know, and off into the unseen world. They would all come out of the cave on on the on Halloween. And so what the locals started doing was they would leave out food for the the creatures when they would come to the doors. They would just take the food and go away, which becomes the sort of, you know, the the trick-or-treat sort of thing, like give food to the give food to the creatures to to send them away. And so all of these little traditions would arise up around just protecting yourself from the creatures that were coming out of Uvan Uvan Agat. And so you know, and I know Angela can talk about the fires more than me, but you know, it also arises around there. The druids have ceremonies around the bonfires and and things like this. So this is where Samhain, in from ancient Irish folklore, has in in very very briefly arisen uh, in Ireland. I know there's some great scholarship out there on that on that subject, but that's a very very brief um, overview of it. But I do recommend if anybody's in Ireland to go, you can actually Google now the Cave of the Cats, believe it or not. And it shows up on a Google map, but you have to walk to it through fields. And um, you can actually, I don't advise going down without quite a few people in case you get stuck because you'd never get out, you know. And so, but they do have tours now where they'll bring you in during the summer when it's dry. If you go in the winter when it's slippery, we'll probably never hear from you again. But if you go in the in the summer, you can go with the tour guide and they'll take you to the Cave of the Cat. So it's worth a visit, definitely worth a visit, worth sitting, meditating, contemplating in that dead space of the cave. I've recently went to Ireland for, uh, during Bealtaine at Ishnock for the fire festival. Mm. <laughs> Um, and it was lovely, by the way. But uh, in terms of um, the history of Halloween, I've actually just released a, a video on the history of Halloween in Britain and Ireland because it's very different from uh, the, the rest of the world. And I think the history of Halloween really varies depending on the on the specific place. And Italy would be completely different altogether. Um, and um, I also recently, since I, I'm a pagan study scholar and I focus a lot on contemporary paganism, I also released recently a video on uh, Samhain, which had a bit of a probably controversial title, which is not controversial because I think it's uh, quite agreed upon by, by scholars, uh, which was called Samhain was not a Celtic fire festival. And um, the, the argument that I present there, which I, uh, of course, advise people to watch so that you have the full perspective. Uh, first of all, Celtic and Irish are not the same thing because Celtic is a bigger umbrella and it doesn't only include uh, the Irish culture. And also it is based on the idea that in contemporary paganism and especially after the birth of Wicca in the 1950s, the um, wheel of the year, the concept of these eight big celebrations in the year, uh, where you have the equinoxes, the solstices and the midpoints, uh, one of which is Samhain, have been celebrated by contemporary pagans and contemporary practitioners. And the name that was adopted um, for 
this festival between the 31st and uh, the 31st of October and the 1st of November was Samhain, uh, based upon the Irish uh, end of the end of summer. Um, now, what the, the misconception that happens often within the pagan community is that when you look at the history of Samhain, it tends to be considered a Celtic fire festival, and that is inaccurate, as I presented in the video based on the peer-reviewed work of historian Ronald Hutton. It's uh, historically inaccurate because every Celtic region, including Ireland, but not just Ireland, all the Celtic areas were celebrating this time of the year in a very different way. So it was not just one way of celebrating it. It was not necessarily with fires. And when there were fires, they were um, often, in some cases, they were uh, used for different purposes, in some cases for protection, in some cases for divination. It was quite varied. So to lump all these things together and say Samhain was a Celtic fire festival instead of being very local and contextualizing uh, historical facts to make them more accurate, I just I think is not the best way to understand what Samhain was uh, historically. So that is the, um, the point that I was making in the video. And apparently some people were unhappy about it. But I think that the, um, the primary misunderstanding was that they were conflating Celtic and Irish. And so there were people saying, oh, but Samhain is an Irish festival. I never said that it wasn't. And so uh, it was, yeah, I think it was really based on uh, people conflating the term Celtic and the term Irish. I'm interested in the, the word that you're using because I'm not sure I'm hearing it correctly. Did you say Salwin? Yes, Salwin. Um, yeah, it's spelled uh, S-A-M-H-A-I-M. N, yeah, so. N. Mm. Yes. That, that would be sort of the uh, historic name out of which Halloween emerged. In America, yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing, is that the history of Halloween is really different depending on whether you're talking about America. So based on my understanding, in America it was brought by Irish immigrants. So, uh, but maybe Karen wants to talk a bit more about this. Well, if I can just add really quickly, Halloween also, it's All Hallows Eve, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a long history in the um, British, uh, in Britain and in Ireland, and even here the history was quite varied, uh, depending on whether the the parts of the countries were Protestant or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, well, the word Samhain is just the Irish, the, the Gaelic word for November. That's what mm -hmm. Samhain means; just means November. In, in there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it's just because because Halloween happened at, and Samhain was just that festival between the 31st and the 2nd of November. But we also, and just to, to speak to Angela's point, that that period of the 31st of October to the 2nd of November is celebrated the world over in all sorts of different ways. Like I think Dia de los Muertos in Mexico is fantastic, completely different traditions. But Samhain, um, Halloween as we know it, yeah, is uh, kind of came out of the game across Ireland and then Ireland brought it, Irish, Irish immigrants brought it to America. So America celebrates Halloween very much in a similar way with, to, to Ireland, where you get dressed up as the creatures that are coming out of the cave, where you leave food, you have food for the creatures to make them go away, where the Druids would, would like build these bonfires um, to, to uh, as uh, as Angela said, fire was was a was a tool of divination for the druids, and so these traditions that emerged from a hole in the earth, you know, have populated a lot of Western culture. Where the Irish went, Halloween followed. There's a viewer who's suggesting Philip Bernhardt House, who says actually Sam Samim is the Sam modern. Okay, is the modern Irish for November, but the original old Irish Samhain, S-A-M-A-I-N, means summer's end. Mm. But it's, just, it's the same, you can see how it's the same thing. It's the end of the harvest, and it's coming into that dormant time of the year when it gets quite dark. And you've got to remember these things are coming out, there's no electricity, these are, you know, there's, it's, we're going into a very short days, especially in Ireland, so much further north 
we've got very, very, very short days. And it's all, you know, when I was in, in my, you know, in my teens or when I was an undergrad, you'd go out and you'd go partying and you'd be going out drinking and you'd go and you'd go to sleep. You, by the time you get home, it was already bright again. Do you know, like you'd go into a pub or a club, you'd come out, it'd be already bright because it's so much further north. So you can imagine in the winter when the days is only maybe six to eight hours of daylight and the rest of it's dark and nothing is growing. And this is the world over. So you can understand why ancient cultures would build folklore that is, you know, representative of their own cultural belief system that changes, you know, all across the world. I'm only speaking to what's coming out of Ireland as an Irish person. I'm not going to try to speak for a Mex Mexican person can speak. to. I mean, I have written actually an article on Dia de los Muertos for the Huffington Post a few years ago, but certainly I would defer to a Mexican person um, on their holiday, you know. Well, Philip Barnhart House, who has also been a guest, on uh, New Thinking Aloud, and a specialist in uh, pagan and esoteric culture as well, has a question for each of you. Uh, he asks, uh, what is the most magical or ghostly experience you have ever had? Um, Angela, would you like to take a crack at that one? The most magical experience that I've had um <laughs> that's blanking now <laughs> let me think um i think that i have to think about this sorry maybe karen <laughs> karen, karen do yeah, you have one first. you want to say god i've loads i don't know i'm just thinking god mo the most magical or most what was it the most magical or most ghostly so on on terms of ghostly i would say my first ghostly might be a good one. My first one, I used to, when I was a very small child, um, have conversations with people in other rooms, like through doors out into the hallway. And my mother would say, who are you talking to? And I would say, the man or Nana, Mary, or my mother would run out to see who had broken into the house. You know, there would of course be nobody there. And I was a three-year-old just having these conversations. And I do remember when I was a little bit older than that, I would wake up and I would just see somebody just sort of standing at the end of the bed, which is quite common. I have a friend whose kid sees that sort of thing now. And I would just see, and they would always have these most exquisite eyes. I always remember that, just such light in their eyes. But they wouldn't, I would never see their legs would kind of like disappear into darkness, you know. But um, since then, I mean, I've, I've had these experiences always. I just went through a large period of time of just ignoring them, you know, when I was an undergrad and I was too sort of full of it, you know, too sophisticated to be buying into this. Um, ignored it all. When you ignore it, it goes away, you know, and then came back. But I don't know where I would begin with the, I don't know where I would begin with the, um, I can tell you one or two that I wrote about in my book, if you want, early on when I was in North, I was in um, Virginia, down in Virginia Beach, and I was researching and writing my first book, which was part of the Northern Ireland Peace. It was a cultural outreach as part of the Northern Ireland Peace process. I was a political journalist at the time when my fiancé died. And um, all sorts of strange things. I was staying in this person's house who was away, and I was staying there for the summer to do some writing. And um, it was this big old creaky dark house, and I was in the attic. Now, it was a converted attic, so it wasn't, you know... Uh, wasn't a Dickens sort of scenario, but it was this big old creaky old house. And um, after my fiance died, all sorts of odd things started happening in this house, you know. So I do remember going to bed one night and then falling asleep and then feeling the weight of somebody sitting on the edge of the bed and waking up with a fright and sort of trying to scramble out into the dark and getting caught in the blankets and fell over and banged my head and couldn't see who it was, you know. I mean, it wasn't pitch, pitch dark, you know, there's like a bit of moonlight coming in, you know, so could not see who it was in the house, grabbed a bottle, started like creeping around the house thinking there's an intruder in the house. Nobody at all, the house was completely locked, you know. But that was one of the first, after he died, that was one of the first experiences I had, you know, and then just went on and on and, and thankfully became bit more productive and helpful than that over time but yeah loads and loads of stories of ghosts you know I could sit here all day talking about ghosts um magic I have to honestly say I think magic 
is everywhere. I think it's a choice. I think seeing magic is a choice. We all have. That's not too dull an answer, but I do. I think there's magic everywhere if we choose to see it. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you, Karen. Angela, have you thought of <laughs> yes. something to share? <laughs> So um, I remember because since I don't share really much of my personal experience, um, I I was trying to think about something that was somewhat related to my uh, to my research and my PhD. And uh, I just you know the, the first experience that came to mind was when I was trying to find a PhD and I was struggling when I was in Italy uh, because it's. I think that in Italy, anthropology of religion is still underdeveloped. And I also think that Italy is a very Catholic country. And only now you're starting to see uh, research on things that are a bit different, uh, luckily. But it's still, it is still at its inception, to be, to be honest. So I was feeling very sad about it because I, I kept having these dreams that it was really important for me to do a PhD. And I thought it was very bizarre because I couldn't quite get why it was so important to do something like that. Now, I guess that I get it. But um, so at the time I was developing this research proposal on shamanism uh, specifically, and then it evolved from that. And I was reading Michael Harner's book, The Way of the Shaman. And I thought, you know what, what do I have to lose? Let me try one of these and let's see where I have to find my PhD since I, I cannot find anywhere where they would have me do a PhD on uh, shamanism and witchcraft. And so I, I did uh, the shamanic journey as it was instructed in the book. And I asked as a question, where, where will I find uh, a PhD? And I saw a map of the UK, but upside down. I still don't know why it was upside down, but there was an area that was in red. And um, since I'm uh, admittedly very ignorant in geography, I had to look up, the, the, <laughs> I have to look it up on, on Google. And I saw that the place highlighted was Chester. And then I thought that Chester was kind of ringing a bell. And I remember that um, a year or so ago, my professor, the one that I did my thesis with, um, talked to me about a former PhD at my alma mater who ha was teaching at Chester. And so I contacted him and he said, I'm not doing, I'm not working at Chester anymore. And he gave me another contact at Chester who gave me another contact, which brought me to my um, PhD supervisor who said that my uh, proposal was very interesting and she asked me to, she suggested that I submit both to the University of Chester and Leeds Trinity University, University of Leeds, Leeds Trinity University, because the PhD was awarded by University of Leeds, but was supervised and funded by Leeds Trinity. <clears throat> so I applied to both, I got into both, and then I decided to go at Leeds because I was also offered a teaching contract. So I would say that, that was quite a magical, <laughs> experience because I don't think that I would have ever thought about coming to the UK or I would have never made that connection if it wasn't for that uh, shamanic journey. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to ask a question, Jeff, or what is what my most magical experience? <laughs> Either. Well, that could be kind of fun to think about a magical experience. I'll think about that. Um, and maybe it'd be fun to hear from you as well, Jeff, on a magical experience. I agree with, I, I love what both of you, Angela and Karen, are saying, because I think that we can have, Karen, you're suggesting that magic can be in every moment, an everyday experience. And I do agree with that. And it can be difficult to see that magic sometimes when we're feeling down, or we can see the suffering in the world, or we have our own suffering. Um, I think love is very magical, uh, being connected to our hearts and uh, feeling that connection, that 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 kindness, which is one of the reasons I love 
being a co-host with Jeff on New Thinking Aloud is that every interview we do, and even with you, Two Beautiful Souls, we connect and feel that interconnectedness that we are we all share. And I also love what you say, Angela, about those larger accomplishments in life, about how you were seemingly, uh, seems you were guided by your soul or divinely guided and that you achieved something in your life that's very significant and then you then bring that to the world you know on days like today how about you jeff what's a uh, one of your most magical moments in your life well you know i've shared so many of them on on this channel or already and, and gone into great detail so i'm going to pass okay on, on that okay. Uh, but we do have a question here from brian kramer okay uh He's interested in negative energy, which of course is also associated with with Halloween. And he he wants uh, each of you to share if have you experienced something sinister, evil, or malevolent uh, in in the um, non physical realm and the psychic realm. And what do you think that negative energy is? That to me. Shall I go? Sure. I'm going to say that I think what's really important when we start talking about negative energy, first of all, the only really negative energy I've ever come across has been amongst the living, I have to say. I've never come across that in the unseen world. I think it's really important, though, that we really factor in the role of perception in our beliefs. And I think that's become increasingly important, not just in terms of the unseen world and in terms of ghosts, but in terms of just life in general. You know, um, the minute we start, I think it's really important. I can't talk about this as the noumena, you know, Barclay talked about this, you know, the Bishop Barclay, um, uh, the Buddha talked about this in terms of emptiness. That reality is not something we can actually approach. Absolute truth is not something we can approach because all we have is our perceptions and our projections and that we interpret everything through the lens of our own perception. And I find that that is, and that's all we are able to do. So we are not able to approach the noumena or the emptiness, which is why Buddhist monks will spend four or five decades meditating to try to approach emptiness to understand the truth beyond perception. And I find that it is increasingly important for me, uh, and it's become increasingly important for me to always remember the role of perception in everything I'm doing. And we can see this, I'm not trying to get into anything controversial, but we can see it with, we saw this with in politics, we see this in war, we see this in medicine, we see this all the time. People, one person has a perspective, and to them, that's the truth. And then somebody else has another perspective. And to them, that's the truth. And what's happening in the world is that we've got these irreconcilable sides. We had it with the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. We have it with Gaza. We have it with Israel. We had it with Trump. We had it with Biden. It, you know, all over the world, this happens. And I think for the advancement of humankind, I think the first step would be understanding that none of us are perceiving absolute reality. None of us are perceiving absolute truth. All we're perceiving is perspective. And so to circle back around to your question about the negative entities, I think we have to factor in where is our perspective? What role is our perspective playing in this? So a very quick example, the guy downstairs from me here in New York City, probably none of you will be surprised from this, was shot dead in his apartment. And I was out, nobody knew, I was out, I came home. I was teaching actually the Edgar Casey Center at the time, and I came home at about 10.30, and there was something odd about the feeling of the apartment. I was very tired, went in, went to bed, woke up at two o'clock in the morning, knowing there was somebody in the room. And um, I remember feeling re the, the, the energy in the room was, was kind of crazy energy in the room. It was a very angry person, it was very, very disturbing energy. And I didn't know at the time who it was, but it was, you know, it was very, very uncomfortable, even for me, who's used to it. And um, I just remember, it's just like so childish, hopping back into bed under the bed covers, you know, because I thought, you know, it's really weird. But the next day, um, uh, I was just like, I don't know who you are and I can't help you. I, I don't even know. I could just feel the intensity there. And the next day, of course, the NYPD, the 53, they're all around and everybody's calling all over the building. It turns out 
that I think he must have been involved with drugs or something, that he had buzzed people into the building, came up and shot him. And his body, when I was experiencing all this, was lying on the floor downstairs, in the apartment downstairs. So after the chaos of that day, um, I went when all everybody had gone away and the police had gone away and the body had been taken away and all the rest of it, um, it, it things kind of calmed down. I felt his presence again, you know, when I was just before I was going to bed. And he felt a lot calmer at that point. And I did say to him, all the people involved in this spoke Spanish, all of the friends and family spoke, I don't speak a word of Spanish. And I had to say to him, like, honestly, I can't just go down to the precinct and start you know, I can't, you can't, I, and I actually teach psychic detective work, but I know how they respond to this. And pretty sure they know who is involved because it was a hit. And so I said, there's really nothing I can do. I can't even speak to your relatives, don't speak Spanish. But if there is ever a time I can help you, I will, you know. And that was it, he was gone. But I have, to, I never heard from him again. But I have to say, the second night, he felt a lot calmer than the first night. Now, if I had had a certain perception, I would have been, oh, there's some crazy negative energy in my apartment. All it was, was a poor, unfortunate guy who was dead on the floor, who was coming to one person in the building who was going to be aware that he can, he still existed. And so, because I'm not really, because I try to challenge perception in every scenario, I didn't go to, oh, let me get out and start burning incense and sage or whatever. I didn't go there because I thought there's just somebody here who's really upset. The next night, as I said, when he was discovered, when his family were notified, he was much calmer. And so again, it just comes back to the idea of negative entities. Is it negative or is that our perception? Yeah, I think that I agree in terms of I I don't particularly like um, seeing energies as positive or negative. I think it's a dichotomy that is not necessarily helpful. I think that people tend to talk about negative energy when they perceive something that could be harmful or detrimental or um, not advantageous for uh, for some reason. Uh, but there could be situations that might feel uncomfortable because because there's a reason and there is something that you have to to learn from them. Uh, so I think that perhaps my I, I would say that it's, it might be a good idea to have a more nuanced conversation about the the concept of negative energies. Well, you pointed out that. Uh... A lot of negative energy seems to be uh, in the human sphere, mm -hmm. not so much in the <laughs> Isn't rest true? Of, yeah. of, of the afterlife. I, I often hear from people reporting about the afterlife is filled with love mm -hmm. and, and uh, positivity, unconditional love. But in the human sphere, it, it seems as if well, I can get very psychological. We we project our own self-hatred onto others. Absolutely. It's all about perception. I mean, this is why I feel like when we listen to people like the Dalai Lama talking about peace, it's never helped. And I grew up in Ireland, so I, I kind of understand what it's like to grow up in a in a troubled area, you know. Um so but you under you come to understand that um Choosing sides like that just causes division, causes an entrenchment of perception. The real challenge is trying to find peace and common ground. That's the real challenge. And that's what the Dalai Lama talks about all the time. When I wrote my first book, that's what the idea was in Ireland to try to reach across the aisle, was to try to find common ground, to try to find a process of peace, which, believe me, even for me, who was just doing a cultural uh, outreach, was so hard, so hard. I have such admiration for mediators who are put into a room with these entrenched perspectives and are trying to mediate these a piece out of these situations. Phenomenal work. Great responses. Carrie Ann Chrysler or Carrie Ann Chrysler has a question. What are some of the oldest representations of ghosts or spirits, which I know is a uh, part of your background, big part of your background, Karen. And also maybe building on that question, I might throw in also to Angela after this, what are some of the oldest representations of 
the witches or magic. Karen, do you want to take that first? Yeah, I would say prehistoric man. I mean, Joseph Campbell has written about this that that um, there are cave drawings of spirits. So there, are, you know, there are obviously the idea of the dis. You know, I I do I feel like almost as soon as we started burying the dead, we started recognizing that there must be another dimension to um, existence. You know, and I know Joseph Campbell has written about how these illustrations have been found in caves. So this is caveman, you know. I think in all traditions all around the world, there has never been a time where there wasn't a ghost. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at Chinese, you look at any any religion, any religion, any culture. There is any culture where I, I believe we started walking erect, there has been ghosts. And there have been burials. Human Humans, I suppose, are unique. Uh, may, maybe there are some other species like elephants, I'm not sure, who have burial grounds. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think that um, when we start to see this, and I know somebody like an anthropologist could talk about this uh, more thoroughly than I could, but it almost feels that that awareness of the need to, to revere the dead, which goes beyond just burying the dead so another animal doesn't get them. But, you know, that idea of needing to revere the dead or honor the dead, you know, is is producing this awareness, this sort of existential or metaphysical awareness of, of us. And having said that, I think, you know, well, I have two cats. I mean, I, I'm sure anybody who has animals knows that the animals are, are looking at people all the time. Children do it all the time. I, I have friends, a friend of mine has, has two children. And one of them, we have great conversations about the ghost species. You know, um, I think that the skepticism is what separates us. And, you know, to come back to your question of magic, it's that skepticism that separates us from the magic. Because, you know, what Andrew described was a very elaborate synchronicity, which Jung talked about. And Jung's family were mediums. He had a lot of mediums in his family, Carl Jung's family. And so he talks about these synchronicities. But these synchronicities are happening all the time if we pay attention. And then people go, God, you know, such and such a thing happened. Wasn't that a coincidence? And it's like, you think it was just an accident. You know, but these synchronicities, these signs, this sort of intuition, intuition is the voice of the spirit, you know, happening all the time. If we can just be open to the possibility, we start to see. But if you're a closed minded skeptic, you're never going to see anything. So that's what I meant about the choice. We can choose to look and perceive or and see, or we can choose not to. Thank you, Karen. Angela, do you have? thoughts about your background and the the oldest representations of witches um the question is interesting because it needs to be unpacked first uh because when we talk about witches we tend to use the the language of today and what is a witch i mean there isn't even an agreement today um let alone in in history because uh in different times and different cultures there have been different labels associated with people that would engage with uh, the metaphysical world in a way that was not considered according to what was understood as possible. Um, So which magic have been often used uh, and they were born as terms of othering both witchcraft and uh, demons basically. So witchcraft was the religion of the other and demons were the the gods of the others and it was a a, a, a way of othering somebody else and saying this is not right this is forbidden so if you talk about ancient representation of witches this would be in a negative connotation because that's how the term witch was used as a term of othering and to label something that is forbidden and you cannot do which has to do with the metaphysical word that goes beyond the physical word, but in um, in that kind of connotation, in that other connotation. So, in this sense, you can find um, in the around two thousand BC BCE the the code of Hammurabi that um, is the Babylonian law code that condemned the use of harmful magic, but. Um, 
it's as I said, it's difficult because first we would have to clarify what we mean by witches because it's a term that is understood differently across time, but definitely uh, in in antiquity and up until recently, it was generally seen as a term of othering. Then in classical antiquity, you also have that there are in the Greek and Roman traditions appearances of witches, like in uh, you we have Circe, uh, Circe in Homer's uh, Odyssey, and we have uh, Medea in Euripides' play. Uh, these are some famous examples. And of course, in the medieval times, you have the the whole conversation uh, the, uh, around the uh, Malleus Maleficarum, which was the Hammer of the Witches, which was uh, published in 1487. Um, so you really have many different representations of witches across, uh, across history. It's just that, as I said, the representation of the witch up until recently, and the representation of witch and witchcraft tends to be generally negative. Um, and then in early modern um, woodcuts and art, uh, we have the, uh, for instance, uh, witch trials and witch hunts of the 16th and 17th century led to an explosion of visual and literary representation of witches. Uh, so we have woodcuts that often depicted them flying on broomsticks, which is a trope that still survives to this day, uh, engaging in sabbats um, and making packs with, uh, with the devil. And in terms of uh, non-European context, uh, I think it's important to remember that beliefs in witches and magical practitioners are not exclusive, of course, to European cultures. So in Africa, Asia and the Americas, various forms of witchcraft and sorcery have been uh, integral to local belief systems. Um, although these do not always really align with how we perceive and understand which in a European context. So I think that the first problem when I when I hear about this question is the definition of which, which is not something that you can easily apply in the in the past. But to give a you know a, a simplifying answer, simple answer, I think that would be mine. Yeah, well it shows that there's different perspectives across culture and among people. Yeah, sure. I think that now we have a much more positive understanding of what a witch is, and it is uh, a lot thanks to contemporary paganism and Wicca uh, in particular, because Wicca really uh, <laughs> tried very hard to change the, the public perception around, uh, around witchcraft and around the figure of the witch. And it really allowed to, to have a public discourse around witchcraft that was not just negative and it was not just people worshipping the devil or having pacts with the devil. And I know that now in the pagan community and in the um, aesthetic practicing communities, you find that there is a, a reconsideration of the ethics that were presented in Wicca, because there's the idea that uh, as it harm none, you can do what you will. Uh, but And also the idea that everything that you do, both in terms of whether it's something good or bad, is going to come back to you threefold. Um, these are some ethical concepts in Wicca that have been heavily challenged by contemporary magic practitioners. But I think that they were so important, at least early on, when Wicca started to, to spread um, in the 1950s in Britain and then in the seven, around the 70s in, in the US and then later in other countries. I think it was so important, to be honest, because it just op allowed for the conversation around witchcraft to be open again, because it was not just seen as evil doers, devil worshippers, and um, uh, people that ate babies and something like that. So there was a, a much more nuanced conversation and more positive conversation around witchcraft as a nature worshipping religion and something that was beneficial and was meant to to reconnect with nature and help the planet and so and also in the US it was very tied to the women and gay liberation movements and um, so Wicca was very reshaped in the US and then came back to Europe for instance in Italy the version of Wicca that we got was the American one and not the, the, Brit the British one which is interesting because Britain is so much closer but uh, that was the one that uh, actually took hold in in Italy. Uh, so I think that Wicca is really we we really need to thank Wicca for for that 
um, and in more recent decades, you start seeing depictions even in the in pop culture that are a bit more positive. And even when there is that there are ethical choices on the part of the the witches or the magic practitioners that could be controversial, they are addressed with more nuanced, not with the idea of the witch is just evil, just a devil worshiper. And, and it's a, a wholly negative figure. It tends to be seen in a more nuanced way. Um, and that's why among the practicing communities now, they are also talking about um, the, the fact that ethics is nuanced and it's not that easy to say, oh, this is good and this is bad in terms of magical workings. Right. and. There's a question here about healing rituals that I want to ask in just a moment. And also, uh, which is at least maybe more contemporary, possibly in history, you, you would know, Angela, sometimes are associated with healing abilities and uh, could be threatening to others. And I do just want to, before we ask this question, I would love it if Angela, you would share maybe a few tips or suggestions on how people can have more magic in their lives and how they can uh, connect with magic. And Karen, as a, after Angela shares, if you would also give some tips or suggestions on how people can communicate with their deceased loved ones or have a relationship with their spirits, because it does seem this time of year, uh, perhaps the veil gets a bit more lifted because we go from the light to the dark and we can connect more within. So. So find more magic in their lives. Um, I think um, having studied uh, witchcraft and magic uh, as an anthropologist, what I find is that one of the things that really uh, strikes me as uh, something powerful about magic that is mentioned by many informants is the, the sense of connectedness that it gives. Um, I remember having a conversation with my, uh, with one of my professors at the University of Naples, where I got my undergrad and masters, and he specializes in Indian religious traditions, and uh, he was explaining that from a Buddhist perspective, magic is a way of sort of uh, going away from your main objective, which should be to uh, reach Nirvana the deliberation because it's a way of feeding the ego feeling like you have power and agency over uh, your word or sort of um commanding the word to do your bidding in that kind of sense but um i don't i don't see it like that at all i see that for many practitioners magic is not a way of affirming their ego or their self on the word it's a way of reconnecting with the word and by acknowledging this full state of interconnectedness, when you alter something in the fabric of reality, you're also altering yourself because there is no separation between you and the other. So that's that's what I what I say. And this professor was mentioning this passage from the Buddhist canon where uh, the Buddha meets a sorcerer who says, after 30 years of practice, I can finally walk on the water. And Buddha replied, you could have just taken a boat. And there was a way of saying, you know, you've lost all the effort that you could have invested in your liberation to achieve something that is uh, quite futile and you could have achieved very easily doing something very simple and mundane. But the way that I saw it is that I don't think that the point of the sorcerer was to just walk on water. I think that the point of the sorcerer was to achieve such a state of connectedness with everything around him that it would allow him to experience that. So it wasn't just crossing the, the river, it was crossing himself, crossing the boundaries between himself and water. So I don't see that as that much different from the, the state of liberation or working um, towards your, your spiritual path. So I would say that I would encourage also people to see magic not just as a way of achieving stuff in your life, but as a um, as a way of experiencing a very deep state of interconnectedness. Because, uh, yeah, that would be the how you can feel magic in your life during this magical time of the year. Beautiful. 
Thank you for that, Angela. Karen, do you have some thoughts on how people can connect with their deceased loved ones or spirits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's it's all kind of wrapped up in the same thing we've been talking about, which is that um, we are in a unified field of consciousness, or as Meister Eckhart, the Christian mystic, would call it, which I love, the abyss of divinity. And so we're all existing in that space. We, if we begin to understand this is the illusion and that the wave form is the is reality, then we can understand that everything is connected. So the way we can walk into a room and get a sense of the energy of the room, that, you know, you can walk into an empty room and have a feeling, oh, this like feels like a nice room or it doesn't. I mean, all of us experience this. You meet a person. And you immediately feel very comfortable with them. You meet somebody else, the hairs in the back of your neck are standing up. This is all um, the exchange of information and the connection that is going on in the on beyond language all the time in our space and with other people. And so if we understand that, then all it takes is to be aware of our loved ones, is to be aware of their presence. So we have this notion somehow, I think it's really, from my research, it's sort of really derived from as early as Dante, probably beyond, probably probably Homer, um, that the afterlife is somewhere else, you know, that we talk about crossing over, we talk about, you know, the other place, we talk about the higher planes. We, we always, we th there's all this language built around the afterlife, like it's some other place, you know, but when we start to understand there's no geography and there's no time, we begin to understand that we are coexisting with all people in the same waveform. And so all it actually takes is an awareness of that. And it's sort of removing the idea that there is someplace else, that we've got to, there's all these talks about you've got to raise your vibration, you've got to get here and you, you know, to, to raise yourself up to them. It's like, why do you think they're up there? You know, we're all together in the same sort of waveform, in the same stream. And all it really takes is just approaching it the same way as we approach that feeling of having walked into a room is just to listen to our just mindfulness critical to being able to bring ourselves into the present to being able to recognize that everything that exists only exists right here in the moment and that once we can still the mind and quieten the mind to some way to become very very much aware of this particular moment in time, then we begin to understand the fullness of the moment in time. And in that moment in time, our loved ones, our spirit guides, everybody else is accessible. And so I always say to people, <clears throat> you know, can my loved one hear me? And I always say, it's very simple. If you have a thought of your loved one, they can feel that thought and will respond. And sometimes people think, I was just sort of washing the dishes and out of the blue, I thought of my grandmother. And I always say, no, you didn't. Your grandmother thought of you and you felt her thought. And so this happens all the time. Again, it just becomes, it's just a matter of understanding. This is the illusion and that we are all connected. And all we need to do is send out a thought and receive a thought. The more mindful we can be, and I actually have practices on my website, if anybody's interested and they're free. Um, you can just go sitting in the power this is a very fundamental practice for mediumship to be able to move into these sort of light altered states, to be able to come become present, sort of step out of the physicality and our preoccupation with the chaos and the stuff of life, to move into these very peaceful moments where we're able to hear and sense and feel and see our loved ones. And so I have on my website, if anyone's interested, if you go join our little community, which is free, practices that are there that help you sort of become still in that moment and to be able to actually adjust very slightly your, your sort of state of awareness, to become aware of the people. But people go around thinking it's this really huge, complicated thing that we have to do all these sorts of rituals. We don't. Actually, what we need to do is nothing. Be quiet, sit, be open, be aware, be open to the possibility and they will respond much simpler than people make it out to be. Great advice. I may I ask a question to Karen, please. So I was wondering for uh, those who have experiences of loved one who have passed and um, 
keep having dreams about them not realizing that they were dead what is that you would advise in those cases sorry so having dreams about a loved one who has passed but they don't know their past is that what you're saying yeah sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Dreams are really dreams are an altered state of consciousness. All communication with the scarlet world happens within an altered state of consciousness. An altered state of consciousness vary from just simple mindfulness meditation to um, hypnagogic states to outer body experiences, near death experiences and dreams. Dreams are a really easy way for loved ones to communicate with us. Because when we're in a dream state, we are naturally in an altered state without having to learn how to do that or practice how to do that. And so it's a very easy way for the consciousness of our discarnate loved ones to actually connect with us without the obstruction of the mind and the stuff in the way. And so that's actually quite common to have dreams of loved ones because what they're trying to do is communicate with you in in a, in a way that is possible for them to do that just do you understand does that make sense yeah but how do you face the fact that perhaps a loved one um does doesn't realize that they are dead oh so you're saying you've had people have had dreams of loved ones and the loved ones don't believe they're dead yes they try to well, convince them that they are still alive yeah well again i've got to go back to kant and go back to the Buddha, and go back to perception, the noumena, and emptiness. I've never in my life, in all the thousands of experiences I've had, had an encounter with somebody who didn't know they were dead. Because the question then becomes, what is death? So this is actually something that's come up quite strong in my PhD research. You know, if consciousness continues, and if we are in physical form, and then not in physical form, but we continue to exist, what is death? A transformation from this earthly realm, perhaps. And it makes me think of we've had a couple other guests on New Thinking Aloud, Father Nathan Castle, who actually has had Angela, like you're suggesting, spirits come to him in his dreams who, who have died. And he often says that they have passed from traumatic deaths where they they're not really like in a purgatory for punishment, but in this kind of in-between place and that he's been guided to assist these souls with healing because there's some healing that he's discovered that needs to happen. And also we've had on Sarah Grace, who is a, uh, was a paramedic who had very psychic and spiritual experiences of seeing spirits and angels around uh, people when they were at accidents or knowing precognitively what to do to help expedite a particular scene. And she also helped facilitate souls in some of those very traumatic deaths. So I just want to offer that maybe maybe those traumatic deaths might um, require some assistance for some of those souls. Thank you. All right. Here's a question from a YouTube viewer whose, whose YouTube name is Music. And Music asks, is it possible to manifest a miracle? And, and then you, Music adds, does anyone know something? I don't. What, well, what, what do you mean by miracle? Do you mean like the loaves and fishes? Or do you mean being aware of, you know, I mean, we know that people talk about manifestation and, you know, um, affirmations. And I mean, Jim Carrey talks about this all the time, how he manifested his $10 million, you know. I mean, so I guess it comes back to what do you mean by miracle? Do you mean the, the magic of everyday life or manifesting a check for $10 million? Like, you know, what's the miracle? You know, it's of course music uh, didn't uh, specify. It could also be like if somebody's dealing with stage four cancer, or maybe they're having infertility issues and want a baby, or some type of goal that they might really want. I'm, I mean, I'm just thinking of some examples, possibly. Not really my area. I just um, manifesting miracles. I do know somebody who had stage four breast cancer who prayed so much, prayed an awful lot and actually is in remission. Um, but could I say that everybody who prays will be go into remission? No, but it, that worked for her. 
Hmm. I think it really depends. Um, I wouldn't make claims on something that is so generic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, to me, it's a question of, of definition, and uh, as Karen pointed out, because I would say just being here at all, being alive in, in a physical universe is, is miraculous. I have no no way to understand that. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a miracle every time these live streams work and that we're all connected <laughs> <laughs> from around the world with all these amazing people and all the viewers in the chat and everybody listening as well. Karen, I have a follow-up question for you as well about communicating with spirits. Do you find that they're always accessible or are there times that they might be having maybe a soul camp experience or if there is reincarnation that they're not always accessible? Um, I would say anybody you have a bond with, it is, but I, again, it comes back to, we need to get beyond concepts of time and space. Um, and, you know, if you came along to me and said, Hey, can you find Elvis Presley for me? I would say no, because unless you have a bond with Elvis Presley, that resonance, that connection isn't, that connection isn't there. But if you've got a connection with somebody, um, and if it's a close connection, it's very, very rare that you send out a thought to that person, they won't respond. You know, the, the more distant that connection comes, obviously, uh, or the, the more distance the relationship the, and the weaker the connection, the more difficult that can be. But I mean, I had one time my high school, my high school English teacher. I, could, I mean, it was so many years since I'd seen her. It took me ages to remember who she was, but she was very influential at my life when I was a teenager. And then here, years and years, decades later, she comes again. So that connection was still there. But I, I don't, I think when we start getting into things like, oh, maybe they're off doing something else, that by definition is bringing time and place, time and space into the equation, you know? And I think in terms of reincarnation, so I'm a practicing Buddhist. I practiced Zen for 20 years. Um, our concept of reincarnation in the West is quite different from what it is in the East. <clears throat> and we have taken an Eastern concept and Westernized it. And so people, so my first question to people when they say to me, you know, will I reincarnate? I'm saying, well, who are you? What's the self? What's going to reincarnate? So think about what's the self. You take away your genes, you take away your physicality, you take away your parents, your culture, your education, take away all of your memories, take away everything that's been driven by body chemistry, take away every relationship you've ever had. And now what's left to reincarnate? And so I just often ask people to think about that because it helps you start to think about the self as something other than, oh, Karen's going to die and Karen's going to be back. Karen won't be back. There will be an essence. Um, there's a there's a Buddhist monk who who is Zen monk who talks about um, the wave, and I think it's a really nice analogy for reincarnation. He says, um, you know, there's the, there's the the metaphor of the wave in the ocean. Like we are all the ocean, and then we we emerge as a wave, and then we return back into the ocean, and we will, and then another wave emerges from the ocean, and then the question is, is it the same wave? So I think, again, it comes back to challenging preconceived notions we have of these things. I, I feel like in my experience, the only way I can reconcile any of these, and I'm, I, I think what we actually know is, is a drop in the ocean of the knowledge that there is, is um, I do believe we are most likely multidimensional beings. Um, I have never, going back forward, I know in some indigenous um, cultures, I, I don't know if Angela knows more about this than me, there is the idea that we can connect back eight generations, and after eight generations, we have advanced into a higher form of being. And so, I don't mean to hog the time, but for example, um, Morris Barbonell, who was a very famous British uh, trans medium around the time of the war, worked with a spirit guide called Silver Birch. And in the story of, and so he he was a journalist, was I love him, and he went into a trance unexpectedly, sitting in a circle one night, and this spirit guide called Silver Birch started speaking through him. And there's loads of transcripts and books now of all of this information. But Silver Birch did say at one point that he was like an intermediary between a team of higher beings. 
they were too far removed from Morris Barbonell to communicate. So they communicated with Silver Birch and Silver Birch communicated with Morris Barbonell. And so I do, for me, it seems in my experience and understanding is that the, the advancement continues into higher and higher realms. But I know I've been able to communicate with people four generations back. And if we knew more about five, six, seven, eight generations back, we probably could communicate with those people as well. But how can we verify who we're communicating with if we don't know anything about eight generations of an ancestor back, if that makes sense? But I think we are probably more, I think we need to get out of this idea there's a single dimension. And if there isn't just a single dimension, that means that we are in a multiplicity of dimensions as well. Do you have any comments on that, Angela? I was thinking about the fact that uh, I was thinking about the, the Buddhist notion of reincarnation because um, I've studied Buddhism when, well, I've studied um, Indian and Tibetan religions and traditions and uh, learned Sanskrit and Tibetan when I was at university. And uh, one thing that always uh, fascinated me was the idea of the self or the concept of no self in Buddhism and the fact that how did that match with the idea of reincarnation um, and the fact that would you know the way that they conceptualize it because they don't believe in a solid permanent and separate self so who gets reincarnated and the idea is that it's similar to that of David Hume the fact that we are a bundle of perceptions and so it's like there's this constant swirling of thoughts emotions and sensations and it changes over your life so we don't remain stable because they don't believe in a solid permanent and separate self and so when we leave the physical body they believe that we enter another one or multiple ones so it is just this sort of stream of thoughts emotions and sensations that we associate to ourselves that can that then incarnate in one or, or multiple um bodies after we uh, you know the, the self that we consider as such leaves our current body so i was just thinking about how that would be you know what are your thoughts on that karen in terms of um reincarnation and the idea of communicating with um deceased ones i mean what is it that is left if uh well, obviously it depends whether you have um, you believe in reincarnation or not, because you might not, or whether you have a belief in reincarnation. Um, what is that you communicate with in terms of speaking with a um, with a deceased person? Well, I think that's kind of fairly consistent with what I was talking about earlier about you know us being in multi dimensions. I'm not. I'm not really. Do you see that little thing floating around? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that happens a lot actually you see these like, little sparks just floating around in the background um, I um, that's probably a reincarnated person I was saying I did reincarnate damn it no, um, uh, I'm not uh, I don't really think in, in that sort of linear way I'm really more of I'm really more of an advocate for the wave metaphor you know and um, if if and I, I really think we again we need to stop thinking of ideas of the self as separate, and the idea of anything as separate. Everything is just the wave arising and returning to the wave. But um, if people reincarnate, you know, I know there's been I read Ian Stevenson's work, and you know, anybody who's read Ian Stevenson's work knows that it's incredibly dry but very thorough. Um, and so it does seem that. There are cases when that can happen, but certainly doesn't seem to be every case. Or there would be an awful lot more than 12 studies. Or I, I know you're probably going to get a load of text messages now, people quoting loads of people who've studied this. But I, I, we wouldn't we all, or the majority of us, remember if it happened to everyone? And so um, it may be that some people are given a choice. I think it's really important to always remember the role of perception. In, and the noumena, and really important to always question how much knowledge we actually have. What do we actually really know? Which is very little. But I, all I can say is my own experience. Um, it seems that some people seem to have had a choice, 
other people continue on. In my experience, people continue, the majority of people continue on. I don't know why people keep wanting to lap around when there's so much joy, power, divine, everything there. I mean, people are like, oh God, you're not afraid of death. I'm like, so excited. What an adventure. You know? I think it's important to remember and to always remember the limits of our own knowledge. Speaking of the limits of our own knowledge, a very interesting question came in from a viewer named Johnny Panriki, who says that a friend of his listening just had to quit listening right now uh, or minutes ago due to a panic attack. And Johnny is asking what would be a an esoteric, fairy tale, pagan like way of encouraging such a person. Person who's having a panic attack now. A panic. Apparently, this conversation uh, triggered. Has induced a panic. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What's the pa Does he know what the panic, what's the trigger? Well, we don't have uh, could... much more than a written comment here. I mean, I, I kind of feel that understanding the trigger is the gateway to mm -hmm. healing, the, what's underlying the trigger, you know. If, if for example, if it was death anxiety, mm -hmm. um, then, um, you know, for me, death anxiety, the way to alleviate that is to really start to explore all of the evidence that we have for the continuation of life. We have a lot of evidence. Like Particularly Jeff's that, essay. Huh? <laughs> like Jeff's yeah. essay yeah. that he won. Yeah, the best evidence for the continuation of consciousness in the afterlife. That's mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. the Bigelow Institute. And, I, and I think also a lot of our fear around death, and I'm assuming Jeff, you could talk about this probably without me, is, um, is this feeling of self-annihilation. Mm. This feeling of having to lose everything that means something to us. And I, and I, and I feel like... You know, that, and that's a very Buddhist concept of accepting impermanence and clinging and attachment and kind of working through that as we go. But I feel like once we recognize the suffering that our uh, clinging to concepts of permanence, clinging to things is causing us, which is fundamental really in Buddhism, so, I'm, you know, is um, that we can begin to see how we are bringing that suffering and those triggers. And, and so the idea then would be to start working on what is underneath that, what is causing this fear of impermanence. But I feel like once we start to understand that everything is impermanence, everything, Pema Chodron is great on this, the Buddhist nun Pema Chodron on uncertainty. And she's able to deliver it in such a way that's very comforting. So I would say anyone who is struggling with concepts of uncertainty to read some of Pema Chodron, Buddhist nun Pema Chodron's work. But, um, you know, we are dealing with uncertainty, but, you know, but we're also dealing with a continu continuity, and we know that we're dealing with co that continuity. So if the fear, if the trigger is the fear of self-annihilation, then maybe, you know, reading, digesting, meditating, contemplating on all of the evidence in the literature we have for, for continuity, for reunification. I mean, the amount of times I find f families are all together, even with their pets, you, you, somebody comes, they want to talk to their mother and their auntie, their uncle, their cousin, their nephew, their dog, everybody, everybody the gang's all there, you know, that we start to see that, that um, there really is nothing to fear. But I do feel that getting to a point, I can, I can say that till the cows come home, but the person needs to be able to experience that for themselves. Yeah, it might it be possible for all we know that uh, the panic attack was generated by early uh, conditioning by, I mean, some religious traditions uh, mm. believe that Halloween itself is, is an evil holiday. It should be abolished. Yeah, they have that in Italy too. Just the to, concept. <laughs> I just, yeah. And I'd love to hear from both of you. We'd love to hear from both of you on that, what Jeff just offered. I also just want to add a practical and I see some people offering some practical advice in the chat as well for that person um, to do some nice deep belly breaths. And mm -hmm. somebody online suggests making this person a cup of tea or going for a walk 
or talking with them, um, but doing something to kind of help them reconnect with their their body as well. So, yeah. Well, I think we'll say just just quickly on that. Sorry, Emma, yeah. I mean, no, is no, that no. Um, you know, panic and anxiety is always future focused. Or we we get anxious because we're anticipating something terrible happening, you know. Um, and so often, um, and I'm not a therapist, so this is, but I'm just saying in my own experience with Buddhist practice, often um, the place to go to with anxiety is to recognizing, I mean, a potential future, a possible future that may never happen, um, and to come back to the breath. You know, it's one of my favorite quotes, just to come back to the moment, just come back to the breath, like somebody saying the belly breath, just finding ways to come back to the moment, because in the moment, the tiger is not eating us, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's one of my favorite Mark Twain quotes is my life has been full of worries, most of which never happened. <laughs> it's great. It's a great quote. Yeah. And sometimes even distraction when you're actually having panic can be really helpful for one myself who also deals with anxiety and has unfortunately experienced anxiety attacks myself. I'm just throwing out some ideas, but you're right, Jeff, it could be that there's some trigger happening with the conversation. That's why it's so lovely to talk with both of you is because we're helping bring uh, awareness to these topics that they don't have to be scary. In fact, they're very beautiful and rich and um, have a lot to offer around spirits and magic i find it very comforting yeah i find i'm much happier in my life now than i was before i had this understanding you know because i feel like it brings a certain a greater purpose to our lives it's also and i had this with the session somebody yesterday where her 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 loved one sort of felt like he sort of knew died quite young or you know i should say transitioned back quite young but lived a life in such a way that was very present. I could feel it with him, all the little things he paid attention to all in his life. Very, very present in his life, almost with that sense of knowing he wasn't, it was going to be a very short trip. And so lived, I could feel within him, lived more in his short life than most people live in 100 years because he was present for every moment of it. And I kind of feel like when we understand there's a continuity, it paradoxically, it makes me feel better about life because I know, let me cherish this moment because I won't have it forever, you know? And I feel that when we're afraid, if we've got a fear of self-annihilation, the anxiety of that can prevent us from being very, very present in those moments because the anxiety is always pulling us out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been meaning to ask this question, of, uh, particularly of you, Angela. Uh, we've talked, been talking about magic, uh, and we've talked about the origins of Halloween. Uh, I wonder if you have any insights about the origins of the word magic. I, I think it comes from the magi of, uh, that are described in the Bible, who would have been, I think, Zoroastrian priests. So, yeah, I can talk about uh, the etymology of the word magic. I also have a dedicated video on, on my YouTube channel. And uh, magic comes from the comes from Latin and from Greek. <laughs> so the first occurrences of the, the term that we find in literature is in Greek, and it refers to magoi. And uh, magoi were uh, considered to be um, Persian people that would recite incantations in a foreign language, which appear to be sort of uh, mystical. Uh, so the the Magoi were the these Persian magic practitioners, basically, who were reciting incantations and working with what we would now call the the metaphysical world. Uh, so and it was considered Magaya would be the the term that magic comes from and magoi would be the magicians in ancient greek um it was it was that kind of practice it was a, a metaphysical practice and it was uh, associated with the magus which was the the persian um, magic practitioner as we would call it today and it was a term magaya that was seen in opposition or alongside another term in greek which is goetheia uh, which is another form of sorcery that uh, is also the origin of the 
the term uh, goetia, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's part of the Lemegaton clavicula solomonis, and it tends to be connected more with the invocation of uh, demons in contemporary historicism. Uh, so magic, as I said, even in that case, um, comes from a term of othering, because it was Greek people that were defining the Persians as those who practice magic. So magic along across history and also the term witch has been have been used as terms of othering. And then just in more recent years, they have been reappropriated because when you see in history uh, figures that were considered not others, but they were accepted, they were part of the accepted elite that was usually not called magic. There was uh, somewhat masquerade as part of what the 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 monarch wanted to do or um it was or the, the religion wanted to do the, you see that in in italy as well with um with the witches especially of the old generation and in past generations they would never call themselves witches they would call themselves as devout catholics who just happened to um you know remove the malocchio or heal sprains and herpes and all sorts of things that the, the doctors wouldn't or couldn't so but they would never consider themselves witches they would consider themselves as catholics um so i think that in in history and up until recently you tend to see magic as a term of othering and you tend to see um also magic as a way of as something that tends to be used in reference to people that are not the people in power Very, i don't know if that answers your question about the origin of the term magic which is in greek in ancient greek but what you're suggesting is there's something i i would use the term uh, antinomian something anti-authoritarian about the very idea of magic um that's a good point um yes and no because in a way there are some forms of magic the ones that are labeled as magic you would say yes they are antinomian but there are there were also across history forms of magic that were integrated in the power structure and they just wouldn't be called as such because there was a, the term to sort of other what was not right i also have a video about whether witchcraft is really forbidden in the hebrew bible and the answer is no because there are forms of what we would now consider magic were acceptable uh, it's just that they were called in their own way and deemed acceptable so it was more the the practices of the other the practices connected to the uh, to the non-israelite god that were considered forbidden not witchcraft it, in itself, the way we understand it now, which is in an all, an all, comp in, in an all encompassing way that uh, in the past was also not the case. Because another interesting thing to point out is that the understanding of magic that we have now as a macro category that encompasses all the different things uh, is relatively recent. Um, whereas before the Enlightenment, you would have an understanding of the different types of practices like divination or um, a mediumship or um, I don't know necromancy or whatever it was it was considered more people would just see the subcategory without seeing the umbrella term uh, the umbrella term has only developed in in recent years so that's also important to to take into account uh, but yeah magic can be antinomian but it was also used by powerful people as well like uh, we know the the famous case of john d who was the advisor of queen elizabeth the first and uh, he was the one who coined the term british empire uh, but that's not something that really transpires uh, he he was not called a witch definitely uh, because he was not the other who was part of the, uh, the the establishment of the time uh, so I find it uh, fascinating the definition that Wouter Hanegraaff, a professor at the University of Amsterdam, gives of historicism as the rejected knowledge, the waste basket of history, because it's the part of history that remains untold. So when you talk about the history of the Elizabethanian era, unless it is something that is specific about esotericism and the history of esotericism, usually the contribution of John Dee gets erased. It's just not talked about. And the same happens with uh, on many other occasions. So 
I think that it's a, a very interesting operative term, the idea that esotericism uh, and magic tend to be sort of the rejected knowledge in, in history, something that is, is practiced throughout, but is rejected. Can I just, Jeff, real quick, add something to that, just to your to your point of um, anti-authorian, uh, anti-authoritarianism? Is yes. that the same goes for the mystics? You know, when we look at the mystics, we look at Rumi moved into Sufism out of Islam, and we look at um, the Buddha moved into, well, created Buddhism out of Hinduism, and that it's almost like all of the mystics we have are not out to sort of challenge authority, but are always seeking something that they're not finding in what's currently existing for them. You know, it's like Meister Eckhart. I was just teaching a class on Meister Eckhart the other day. And, you know, he's a Christian who was tried as a heretic, you know, for the way he was talking about our direct union and oneness with God, you know. And so it's almost like the mystics are similar then probably to the practitioners of magic because it's always looking for something more than the accepted doctrine. Good point. And we're just about out of time. It's uh, near the bottom of the hour now. Uh, I think it'd be uh, good to remind our viewers once again that they can reach you at karenfrancismccarthy.com. Mm -hmm. And Angela, I know you have a YouTube channel. And uh, for people who want to, do you want to uh, give out the URL, Angela? Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, do I have to post it somewhere? But it's Angela Symposium on YouTube. And you also find me on all social media platforms. And I have a website as well, uh, drangelapuka.com. And of course, they uh, will be uh, written out in the description accompanying uh, this video as, as well. Emmy, any final words from you? Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this. We could have gone for another hour. There was a question around, are there any healing rituals associated with Halloween or ghosts? And I know we're at the bottom of the time, but I'm wondering if you could maybe each briefly share in like under 30 seconds, if you have any rituals you participate in this time of year or any um, ways you're celebrating Halloween this year. Well, for me, very, very briefly, I always feel as a healing medium um, that healing comes from being present, being moving into an altered state, asking for the healing of the spirit, the unseen world to come flow to us and through us. Um, so I think that, that goes for any time of the year. I personally find it very healing to get out and walk because I love the, the transition. So I find that very sort of meditative and very healing. That's from my vantage point, I'm sure. And it's probably different. I, th I also think that walking is, is pretty he healing, especially walking in nature. Um, so I think that I, I will just do something to feel the sense of connectedness that I was talking about, and that is definitely healing for me. That's probably under 30 seconds. So I did very well. <laughs> um, thank you both. Yeah, it's thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure to be with each of you again, and I you know, hope we uh, continue. You're both welcome back on New Thinking Aloud in the future. You're both charming and uh, dynamic and uh, brilliant guests, uh, so I'm, I'm delighted that we've reconnected. Likewise, Jeff. Yes, likewise, Jeff. And Emmy. <laughs> and Emmy. I've enjoyed it. Thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Jeffrey Mishlove, for creating this platform for all of us to play, love, and come together. And, and for all of you who are joining, thank you for being with us because you are the reason that we are here.